Oh, it's nice. I didn't want to use that one. We got that one. Go on the other side and come this way. Nice, Bob. And he's a national treasure, and you have to kind of take care of him. You know, I want him to be very powerful for us. I want Robert to be able to look back and think of it as his greatest role. Stand by for picture, please. We're going to go again. Block, please. So, folks, that's a good night to Annette, to Dean, and to Bobby. Yay! I was expecting applause. Yeah. Working with Annette Benning was a real joy for me. It was a joy for me because I had so many things going on, and, and uh, the one thing that the great actors have in common is you never have to worry about them. I looked up, and there was not only my actress, but there was an ally. Let's go to picture. The woman needed to be of an age where she was just about to turn the corner on missing love. I wanted someone like Annette Benning, who, if she was never going to get it, was still going to hold on to her pride. And that's what Annette brought, was a certain authority about being everything that a woman is. I spent a lot of time in that house because I'm, I'm, you know, the woman in the house. So I was there a lot. It was, it was so comfortable. It felt like my house. It really did. Except that there were lots of crew guys in there all the time with a lot of hot lights steaming it up. To see her work, to see her come in here and throw herself into the, a boy's movie. Because traditionally women don't have big parts in westerns. They're the ones that sit and wait for their, if their men come home or don't come. And, and to see her, a classic actress, throw herself at this was really, uh, number one, uh, uh, great for me to see as a colleague, as a fellow actor. And as a director, a it really me. lightened my load to have her come in and, and instead of her saying, well, what am I supposed to do here while you guys are all doing this? She never once said that, and, and, it, and she has no idea how I appreciate that. Our big extra day. These are these are our kids. I got laryngitis for about um, ten days, and we I, were able to film around it. Never stop shooting. I think we can hide. I think yeah. we can hide, hide that. Mm -hmm. Probably added a few more miles to my legs because instead of being able to say something from twenty feet or a hundred feet to somebody, I had to run all the way over to them and kind of yell into their ear. <laughs> Things weren't going my way in certain instances, <clears throat> but one could also argue that they went perfectly. Shooter, don't get in here. Get back in here. All right, your brother's there. You see him? And then, then, then it has power to shoot. If you're right here, we, it doesn't have the same thing, okay? You know, there is a point in every actor in every scene, which is, well, no matter how large a scene or how smart, which is, well, what about me? What am I supposed to be doing when this is going on? And that's a very legitimate question. And in a shootout where you have guns going off, which by nature, even when they're fake guns, are dangerous, you kind of have to know what everybody's going to be doing. And all of a sudden she's going to grab you and you take off and pull her off. That's it. And there's a ballet. There's a organization to the chaos that you have to try to, to understand. Action! They have to see why that works. Why does it work for them to shoot now? Why does it work for them to walk here? They have to have their own logic, their own survival instincts as an actor. And I try to think of that for them so none of them are left feeling stupid. Like, well, look, all this is going on and I'm doing nothing. That's good. I, I, we'll clean that up because that's important. Because yeah, I yeah. want you to not be um, whooped. Yeah. You're going out, you're not a gunfighter. And that was good. Our guns are in full load. Watch your ears. This is what we've all been waiting for. This is fun. One of the, the hallmarks of the Western is the, the inevitable shootout uh, on some level, whether it's on a grand scale or a classic where two men face each other in the street. And that that signifies the end of the story, the end of the movie, the end of the problem. Let's keep the majority we all know that buzz because we've all experienced it in junior high or in high school where you actually knew a fight was going to take place. It's an electric atmosphere and, and it travels very fast. I actually wanted to show the people leaving the town that didn't want to be around for this. A front wide of them and then do one where you're pushing on them. The gunfight was storyboarded severely. We really tried to 
know what we were doing there. What we're going to try to do in every frame is have somebody else shoot it while somebody else is shooting so we keep that activity going. So it's one, two, three, boom, boss is four. But in the first couple of times we do these masters, you guys are just going to take them and go so that we start to get body position. What was important for me in the gun battle was not to make the gun battle of all times, but to make a logical fight that had chaos. You're firing, you're firing. Shh, listen up. Sir Michael, you're, you're getting up and backing and shooting and as we go away. There's the initial uh, blast, you know, the shot heard around the world that starts it. If see the marshal ain't with you. You won't find it so funny when you're all shot the hell and dying. You the one killed our friend? That's right. I shot the boy too and I enjoyed it. And action. Exactly, even try to stay up straight a little bit. So as soon as everybody saw that Kim Coates character getting popped with one shot in the forehead and falling back, we just said, oh my God, this is going to be great. I wanted to also create moments of breathing and trying to figure out and knowing that this battle is not over, that it continues on. And, and I think that's part of the enjoyment of the audience is that it just doesn't start and stop, you know, and it's over. It starts, it stops, it, it winds itself back up. It gets, becomes maybe more violent they, than they even anticipated. The surprises are greater than even the first one. And Kevin always said, when this gunfight starts happening, I want people to think it's more of a documentary, you were there kind of, kind of feel. So there's a few really dirty angles of what, what's happening. And at the moment when Sue gets taken hostage, the camera just goes crazy on a cinema verite level. And we're just shaking it and we're just following. And it, it, was, it was a new level of kind of like realism. I believe Kevin's favorite shot in the movie is when he is running through the back alleys and we come leading him out of a very dark alley and pan and reveal the moment where, where Sue is being held and all the townspeople are back there, wham! Which brought Charlie's character to the surface where he realized, oh my gosh, this guy really is what he says, what he's been threatening all this time. Oh my gosh, he really is like that. Some of the gunfight was photographed with this tool. This is the lightest weight 35 camera in the world. All of the uh, photography with Baxter, we called it the cat and mouse moment, where, where Charlie is cat and mouse with, with Baxter. And he's being shot at, and he's crawling behind the water trough. And we reveal the little girl, and he, and he gets up, and we see his face, is all red face, and he turns and he aims the weapon at, at the little girl. That was done with this camera. Full load, big fire in the hole. You hit? I'm good. Boss is inside there, and uh, he sees a guy sneaking along the wall like this, and to this point, through the slats, gets to this point, and as he turns like this, Boss empties both barrels. The stunt guy actually gets hit by the explosion. He actually flies across and lands against this wall. The trick to this is to be able to blow that out with a lot of force at the same time having him right here. So we use a combination of high-pressure air and sand. Camera's rolling. Action. So far we've probably fired, I would say, a thousand rounds this morning with uh, all the different particular takes and cuts that we've done so far. So it's uh, been a busy day for us. All told, we could probably go through 5,000 to 7,000 rounds by the time we're done shooting. I think the re reality of situations are just as entertaining as the lie <laughs> or the fabricated thing to make things easier because if you actually develop a situation uh, around it's the reality, drama will present itself, humor will present itself, the story will not suffer by recreating something to the detail that it is, it's, it's uh, associated with being real. You know, when I see things that 
aren't even close to being real. And, and uh, you can go back and you look, I look at a lot of movies that I looked at when I was a kid and I just simply enjoyed them. But now as I look back on them, there's just this uh, quality of... Uh, Wagon wash. When there's a lack of reality, what happens is it suspends your belief to the point that nothing holds anymore, nothing sticks, uh, nothing's at stake. And when you start with the little details of things, I think you have an opportunity. If you believe in the little things being right, if you believe in the reality of the smallest detail, then that'll carry through an entire movie. And as you move to the bigger moments of your movie, if you don't abandon the reality of the situation, be it the tenderness of a situation or the sheer terror or the dilemma of where you find yourself, those moments um, are heightened because they are something in a, in a sense subconsciously we relate to them. He said, you should know since you was there. Well, even that wasn't this damn wet. One thing certain, no one ever shoveled as much bull from them he had aboard. You know, I think what's interesting about these movies is that, you know, if wagons get stuck, they have to get unstuck. And that means these guys have to do it themselves. And, and if you try not to avoid that reality, you can find that a certain piece of drama can come out of it. And I think that's what happens here is we use, we, we let, we set the stage for people watching this Western. Yeah, these guys, their wagon gets stuck. They got to dig it out. A lot of joy in movies, you know, where they take you. Little did I know that, you know, when I made this Western, I would find myself in Prague dealing with individuals, men and women, who didn't even share a common language. One of the really hard parts of the movie, actually, is, is it's the most beautiful part of the movie making process and one of the real hard parts because. I don't know how to do this part, so I find myself really dependent on Michael. Uh, most of the filmmaking process I understand. I know how all the things work, technically speaking, but you know, I basically find myself at the end of the movie handing it over to an accomplished uh, musician, orchestrator, composer, and saying, can you make this better? Can you make this unforgettable? I like those, the way that wait. It's really kind of fun. The interesting thing about music is you don't have to have the ability to make it in order to understand it. There's almost a sports analogy there too, which is you don't have to be a great athlete sometimes to be able to recognize a great athlete. Music is something that we're all able to weigh in on, and. Uh, I'm interested to see it line up with our uh, our horses. Um, the reality is, how do you weigh in on it intelligently, and how do you exercise your opinion with a certain kind of grace when you're when you're actually talking with somebody who their whole life is based on music? Just hang on to the D, because it's their genius and it's also my movie. So. Who is going to cast the final vote? You know, who's going to break the tie? And the thing in the heart. So you, you, know, you have to try to be magnanimous and have a sense of authority. I like the strength of the music right there. And, and besides that, the music went into the bar pretty good anyway. So to me, that slam always worked that woke him up. 
on his tummy, the, the thing jumps. Awesome. They sent me a bunch of beginners. <laughs> None of these people have ever played before. back in it's like movies are like gifts and you want to give them to people just the same way as when you read a great book or you hear a great piece of music the tendency is to want to share that and one of the great stories is Herb Kohler it's locked Herb wanted to take the experience that he had being in a movie and he wanted to share it with his community Sheboygan in Kohler Wisconsin and um, we did that and we flew back and they uh, used that movie as an opportunity to raise money for a couple of worthy causes. So you say, what's the value of the movie? The value of the movie that day was that it raised six or seven hundred thousand dollars for charity. People gathered in the name of another idea and the movie was the reason that people could gather and I feel good about that. the house? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Did you get the clouds? <laughs> no, you told me you were going to go from the clouds down to the house. Oh, no, no, no. They're in the front. Who's in the front? I don't know. The need to finish this picture, I somehow I, my body shut down and closed on it. I finished the movie and about two weeks into post back in L.A., my doctor came over and because I said I, w I just wasn't feeling right and he had no idea and he looked at me and said, I'll bet you $100,000 you're in surgery today. And uh, I said, I'll be to work on Tuesday, <laughs> but I wasn't. I, I found myself on morphine for about seven days. I'll always be thankful to God for letting me finish this film. My expectation is that open range be exactly what it is I envision, which is a, is a way of life that was disappearing and a kind of man that had to operate on that land at that time, what kind of man it took to do that. And for you to feel the consequences of those decisions and for you to live inside the dilemma that's created. And if I can do that, I feel like open range, the ex my expectation for open range will match yours, which is you've tasted a little bit of the American frontier.